Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for braving this challenging and quite inclement uh, weather. Trees are literally uh, coming down, but uh, some of us are still standing. So I want to welcome all of you to this uh, colloquium on ethnographic explorations in the global south through music. And my name is Richard Snyder. I'm a professor of political science here at Brown, also a faculty fellow here at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. I want to, I want to welcome you for uh, a two-day session that's going to be featuring three uh, extraordinary talents, extraordinary musical artists. I want to welcome them here to, to Brown and to Providence, Will Calhoun, Melvin Gibbs, and Vernon Reed. A warm welcome. We're not going to formally, I'm not going to formally introduce them now. Formal introductions will, will come uh, and flow over the course of the, of the session. Um, tonight is part of a series of events that's going to be culminating tomorrow night with uh, a concert by these three in the guise of the Zigzag Power Trio, or the ZZPT. And that concert will take place at 8 o'clock tomorrow at FET Lounge which is at 103 Dyke Street here in Providence. So I encourage all of you to be there. They'll be joined on saxophone for a few songs by my friend and colleague, Stefan Alexander, who is here. And they are celebrating the release of their brand new disc, which just came out. Um, I believe the cover art is by Vernon. Is this uh, Vernon's uh, very interesting design? And, you know, this is an amazing disc. There's a warning, though. This is not easy listening. It is not easy listening. It is very rewarding listening, but it's not easy listening. But it's rewarding. I'll just leave it at that. Um, OK, so let me say something about the organization of the colloquium. So very, at the very outset, I'm going to acknowledge some of the institutional and staff support that made this event possible. Then I'm going to introduce my colleague and the co-organizer of this event, Stefan Alexander. Then Stefan's going to come up and introduce our principal speaker, uh, Will Calhoun. Will's going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes. Then I'm going to come back up and introduce uh, the two other panelists, Vernon Reed and Melvin Gibbs. And then they're going to come up and join us for uh, some comments and discussion. And at the end of all of that, we'll open it up for questions and and answer uh, from all of you, OK? So that's the flow. So acknowledgments. The visit to Brown by, by Will, Melvin, and Vernon was made possible through a collaboration that involved the following partners, the Watson Institute, in particular the GPD, or the Graduate Program in Development here at Watson, the Presidential Scholars Program at Brown University, co-director of which is Stefan Alexander, the Department of Physics, the Department of Africana Studies, and last but not least, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown. For logistical support, a shout out to Pete Bilderback, Senior Program Coordinator in the Physics Department, Ellen White, Senior Events Manager here at the Watson Institute, and then John uh, Mazza and Alex Laferriere, who are taking care of media for us today. Thank you very much. All right, let me quickly introduce my, my colleague, Stefan Alexander. He is a professor of physics here at Brown. Stefan taught previously at Penn State, at Haverford, and most recently at Dartmouth College. I am personally delighted that Stefan decided to come back home to Brown. I say home because Stefan earned his PhD in physics here in 2000. And his return has been really a welcome breath of fresh air for the university. Uh, this can be seen in the, in the exciting and diverse programming and people that Stefan has brought to the university, including the three artists that you're about to hear speak today. Um, I don't want to say much about his contributions to theoretical physics, because I can't. It's above my pay grade. Um, if, unless you know what fermionic charge density 
or loop quantum gravity or emergency parameters are. I don't. I'm a social scientist. I'll just leave that for uh, another occasion. I do want to say something about his musical side. Uh, Stefan is a very talented musician. He's a jazz saxophonist, and he has two albums. Um, one here is called Here Comes Now from 2014 with the hit song Dance of the Illusion. The album has been described as, quote, a postmodern collage of sounds and influences ranging from Sun Ra to Brian Eno to Tropicalia-influenced electronic music with a free jazz band. That's a lot of stuff. Sounds like fermionic charge density to me. He's also the author of a best-selling book, The Jazz of Physics, which is about the secret connection between music and the structure of our universe. It also focuses on the parallels between the improvis improvisational nature of jazz music and the improvisational or the improvised nature of the physical world. So please join me in welcoming Stefan to the podium, and he will take things from here. So, you know, one of the great pleasures of being at a place like Brown is um, running into friends and colleagues um, like Richard Snyder. Um, in fact, just the other day, like, we were on the phone, and I said, you know, Richard, I've been struggling with this, um, this, this, the hardest class I actually took in, in college was a political science class, actually. And, um, but one of the most important ideas I learned about was these three dimensions of power that I'm, like, telling everybody about. And so Richard and I, was, we were talking on the phone about the connection to that and maybe the laws of physics, for example. So that's the cool thing about being here and having colleagues like Richard and also collaborating on, on events of this nature. Um, so the minute I told Richard about, you know, these guys, he was like, I, I've, I've listened to everything that they've, like, you know, they've played. I'm exaggerating, of course, but certainly he's listened to a lot of stuff. Um, so I want to um, now introduce um, a dear friend and um, a, a colleague and someone, basically, um, before I give, like, a kind of formal introduction, and I'm not going to be long-winded here because, you know, we want to actually hear Will, I think it's important to contextualize things here. Um, when I was at, um, 20 years ago, a postdoc, no, not 20, 20, 17 years ago, a postdoc in the West Coast, um, I became good friends with a, a person named Jaron Lanier. Does anyone know this name? He is a pioneer of virtual reality. Um, and Jaron has the largest collection of instruments in his home. And Jaron said, you have to meet a friend of mine. Um, his name is Will Calhoun. I was like, wait, how are you friends with Will Calhoun? I know Will Calhoun. When I was in college, you know, on the Black Rock Coalition and Live in Color, and like, I, I know Will Calhoun. Like, you know, I used to try to impress my first dates with Will Calhoun's music. You know? I know Will Calhoun. You know Will Calhoun? Wait, what's Will Calhoun doing hanging out with a virtual reality pioneer? And he goes, oh, yeah, we had a gig one time at the, the Knitting Factory. Okay? So that's, if you, if you want to think about who Will Calhoun is, that's, right? He is an, a very unique musician in the sense that here is someone who is a multi-Grammy Award winner, the only drummer I know that's won a Grammy Award in jazz, I think that was with Wayne Shorter, and in rock music, you know, played with everyone, produced most deaf, so, you know, in terms of his breath, um, has kind of and, and it, do, it, does, it didn't stop there. And today we're going to hear about his journey and basically where it actually continues. And um, I'm going to leave it to that. So on, you know, I, was, I did pull up something. I realized that there's like a list of like on the order of like 50 some odd like great musicians, like really famous people. And I'm just not going to take all your time and do the name dropping. You can go online and see how, how lucky we are not only to have Will, but to also have um, these other two extraordinary musical geniuses, in my humble opinion, um, who will then later join for a panel discussion. So on that um, little note, let's welcome Will Calhoun. Wow, what an introduction. Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Stefan, for that introduction. I'm going to cut right to the chase. Um, 
I'll just get a little bit into my background, humble beginnings, what started me to want to take this journey that I'm still on. And I'll just begin with being growing up in the Bronx. I'm from the Bronx, uh, Vernon and Melvin, a Brooklyn guy, so I have to say that I was born in a hospital in Brooklyn. Otherwise, they're going to let me have it later. But I um, <laughs> but, uh, grew up in the Bronx, New York, and, um, and I'm proud of that community, which I still live in, and I'm proud of that I felt, I still feel, that cultural environment that prepared me for the world, because I went all over the world, and everywhere I went, everything that I learned on the streets of the Bronx was very helpful for me to either learn, educate myself, etc. So. The vastness comes from the history of basically how I grew up. Okay, I grew up in the Bronx, and um, I had very beautiful neighbors. It was a real village. I, I'm from one of those neighborhoods where if you went a mile or two away and I did something wrong and Ms. Johnson saw me do something wrong, she would call my mother up, and Ms. Johnson had the permission to give me a spanking or a tongue lashing, and when I got home, I got two or three more. This changed the dynamic of our behavior and how we acted around adults and how we carried ourselves as young men and young women, et cetera. Certain things were just not allowed. It's very informatively tribal in that way. Um, grew up in a single parent home. My, my mom was really into diversity. Um, but just in my community alone, my neighbor behind me was a gentleman named Raymond Chu, who you guys know now as Ray Chu. Ray, Raymond Chu was a classical pianist who wound up becoming I'll cut to the chase. By the time he graduated from high school, he became the musical director for Ashford and Simpson and Diana Ross and folks like this when he was 16 or 17 years old. Ray lived in my backyard, a gentleman named Steve Jordan, who went on to become a, fant he is a fantastic drummer and producer, lived a few blocks away. He was a drummer. I used to stand on top of his little, his, his parents' milk crate, peek in the garage and watch him practice. Steve went on to do Saturday Night Live at the age of basically NBC television. He was in the orchestra at age 18. He's producing Super Bowl halftimes and so on, doing those kind of things now. Uh, there's a long list, but I'm saying this to say when you're 9 and 10 years old and you have these kind of neighbors, you do realize that nothing's impossible because these are people that I grew up seeing. I went to church with them. I went to camp with them. Their parents came over to see my parents. They talked about what kind of education they wanted, it, they wanted for us, how they wanted us to behave, et cetera. So that was the seed. Those were the, sort of the early seeds. The diversity part comes from my mom putting us in Jewish summer camps, which I didn't know they were Jewish until I had to learn Yiddish songs. And I didn't know the songs were Yiddish until I was singing them on the bus when I was in third grade. And I had Jewish people looking at me like, where did you learn that song? And I would say, in camp. And they would say, well, what kind of camp do you go to? <laughs> and then I went home and I told my mother, this lady was asking me what kind. I didn't know. She just felt like that was the camp the three of us, I have an older brother and sister, needed to go to learn something else. It was very important that we had that kind of experience there. So a lot of our chess tournaments, my sister doing ballet, doing dance, my brother and I studying music, she didn't want to put us in comfortable scenarios that she knew she felt were where quote unquote black folks would go or not go. The information was what the most important thing she wanted to have for us. My favorite magazine when I was a child was National Geographic. Um, my father w was a naval sea captain, so he traveled around the world most of his life. and. Our house was kind of interesting in that I had uh, ashtrays from Egypt. Um, I didn't realize that the, the, the chair that I sat on when I watched cartoons when I was a kid, I thought it was a chair for a child because it was small. And until 15 years ago, I was riding a camel in Morocco, I realized that camel seat was just converted into a bench. But I looked at the camel seat, excuse me, and I said to myself, wow, you know, that's the same thing that I sat on all my life. Now I'm on a camel and I'm riding it. So it was that kind of a kind of a background for me that made me want to really get into music and the world and people beyond the norm, so to speak. What helped me get there, honestly, was being in living color, being able to travel, and being able to go around the world and go places. And I've always wanted to uh, um, involve myself to learn about other people, other cultures, and other music. And a lot of the things my father brought back, you know, money, when you walk around the house, you have, you know, money from Iraq on a dining room table, and you have, you know, these different things that you want to know. We had very strange toys. The rest of the kids had bikes from the local bike shop. We had bikes from Germany, which I couldn't get fixed when I was nine years old. I would go to the bike store, and a guy would tell me to get out of here. What is that? But these are the kind of things that my father brought home for gifts for us from traveling around. And 
all of a sudden I realized there is a world out there. There's other things for me to do and try and invest myself in. So that's kind of really where it started. Yes, the first love came into wanting to become the best musician as possible. And New York City is one of the most amazing cities to grow up in for art and information with the museums, jazz clubs, punk clubs, rock clubs, etc. So I had a chance to get my feet wet. I'm the youngest of three. My older brother shouldn't leave him out of the mix. He was a prodigy <laughs> playing drums when he was about 12 years old. He started doing pro gigs. And I would hang around my younger brother and watch how he was playing and check out the environment of the music business, so to speak. So those kind of things led me to really want to become a great musician, seeing Steve and seeing Ray Chu and seeing so many other people. Another gentleman, his nickname was Pumpkin because he was kind of a round guy, Errol Bedwood. And Pumpkin was a guy who could play the hell out of the drums, play classical piano, great acoustic and electric bass player, but was a pioneer for the art of hip hop. At the time, people weren't sampling and, and recording and, and doing this kind of thing. And in 1972, Pumpkin was selling beats to record labels, something that just wasn't happening at that time. And um, Pumpkin was one of the people I was ambivalent about pursuing music, and he always smiled. He would always go, man, Calhoun, you just, just got to do it. That was his answer. I'm thinking about this. You just got to do it. Just got to do it. And Pumpkin inspired me when a few of my colleagues and, and family members and elders told me not to pursue music, don't go down this road. He told me, no, man, go, go and do it. It's a beautiful thing to do. So those experiences led me to being fearless about jumping into the pot. And to get to traveling and getting around, uh, I have to say my first, I went to Berkeley College of Music, graduated from Berkeley, I was an engineer, recording and engineering major. I got out of school and um, my mom, who was a serious academic, was not happy with me being home. You know, she came home from work. I could have put a new ceiling on the, on the house or, you know, built a barn for her. It was, she came home from work and I wasn't working. That was unacceptable. So she gave me a, a period of time to, to get myself together, which put the pressure on me, but it was, a, it was a beautiful thing. So my first professional gig was with a singer named Letta Mbulu. She's a South African singer who was very popular, like a Marion McKeeba. And her husband's name was Kaifis Samana. And Kaifis basically is the South African Quincy Jones. He does all the arranging, all the scores, and all of this for most of South and West African film, music, and artists. And I'm 19 years old, 20 years old, coming around the scene. The entire band is South African. And that was my first experience with meeting people who can play five or six instruments extremely well. It was quite actually threatening at one point when the background singer came over to me to show me some cool drum beats that I never heard of before. And I was like, damn, I got to play in front of her now? You know, she's just, so it was, it was that kind of ego checking thing. Letta opened up for Harry Belafonte and uh, she did a brief tour for three or four months and then Harry approached me and said, man, you know, would you be interested in playing in my band? Which was shocking because the Harry Belafonte that I knew was the one was political and my mother said he was gorgeous and blah, 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 and the records were in the house and I saw him on television. I didn't relate to him in this kind of a way. But um, it worked out that he wanted me to, to, to join the band and I did. And this was my first informative experience with hearing about international politics. Harry's the kind of man you can ask him about anything and he'll talk about it. Hollywood at that time, being blackballed, what it was like to be in a film, him and Sidney Poitier washed dishes together in the same restaurant, etc. So I took advantage of that opportunity to hang out with Harry, and that's kind of where the information started to come internationally. And I want to tell you a quick Harry Belafonte living color story, if you don't mind. Um, I'm just meeting Vernon around this time, just starting to play with living color. We're starting to make a name for ourselves, and I was living color was starting to become popular where we were playing more often, but I was still touring with Harry. So we had a weekend off and Vernon told me, we got this big gig at CBGB's, man. This is a really important gig. And fortunately, I had the weekend off on Harry's tour. So I figured I'm going to sneak off the tour and I'm going to fly into New York and do this gig with Living Color. So I'm, on the, I'm in the airport and I'm online to get my ticket. And I hear somebody go, Calhoun. I'm like, you know, who knows me in the airport? I look over, it's Harry Belafonte. So I'm thinking to myself, shit, you know, I get fired. Just got the gig. But I'm not going to lie to him. 
So he says, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm going to New York to do this gig. And he said, um, oh, I'm going to New York too. He said, why don't you sit with me? And I was, you know, my stomach's already in a knot. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm cool, thanks. I bought my ticket, so I'll go to get my ticket. And then he upgrades me to first class. And I thought to myself, you know, what's going on? So I get on the plane. Now I'm sweating. My palms are sweaty. I'm nervous. I walk down. He has a newspaper in front of his face, so I can't see him. And then when I sit down, he puts the newspaper down, and he smiles at me, and he goes, how's it going? So I'm nervous and figuring out how am I going to tell my mother that I got fired from Harry Belafonte's gig. Flying to New York, he doesn't ask me where I'm going, what's going on, what I'm doing, nothing. He's totally cool. As the plane starts to land, he goes, what are you going to New York for? And I figured this is, this is the time to just level with him. And I said, well, I'm going to play this band called Living Color. He goes, what kind of music is it? And I said, it's rock. Where are you guys playing? So you probably wouldn't hear this venue. It's called CBGB's. He said, hey, man, record the show, because when, when you get back, I mean, I want to I hear it. So then I knew I was going to get fired. So I land in New York. I do the gig. I come back to the tour, and it's a storm like this, and we're supposed to fly from Buffalo to Canada, and we can't because of the weather. So we take a bus. I didn't know Harry was a jokester. So the weather is just like tonight. We're driving up, going into Canada. Harry gets on the, the microphone of the bus, and he goes, hey, Calhoun, uh, get that, where, where's that tape? You got that tape? And everyone in the band, I'm new in the band, I'm the youngest, everyone turns around, looks at me like, what the, what the what are, you know, what, what's going on here? And I said, um, nah, Harry, I don't have the tape. He said, where is it? I said, it's, uh, it's in my luggage under the bus. He goes, oh, okay. 15 minutes later, the bus starts slowing down. The bus pulls over. Harry says, go and get the tape. <laughs> and I'm saying, uh, Harry, uh, you know, it was raining outside. He goes, and I had the tape on me, but it's the one thing I didn't want him to hear. So I put the tape in my pocket. I go off, I get off the bus, go under the bay like I'm really looking for the tape, come out, get back on the bus, and I hand him this cassette. And I said, you know, if you don't mind, I would appreciate it if you didn't play this music on the bus with everybody to listen to. And he goes, no, man, it's cool, no problem. We get to Canada, we play. Me being new and being young in the band, he used to always come up to me at Soundcheck and go, man, how's it going, Calhoun? You enjoying it? You having a good time? Because I was new, I was replacing a drummer that was there for 17 years, and the band was giving me shit, okay? Like, I, even when I would eat by myself, they would come over with napkins with, man, when you play this rhythm, do me a favor. They were just intimidating me for fun. And I was taking it, because I was learning something. And, and, and Harry would say, man, if those, if those guys are bothering you, man, you, you know, don't, you let me know. This is my tour. And I said, no, no, I'm cool. I could take it. The next two days after that tape, he didn't talk to me. He didn't say good morning. He didn't say how's it going. He didn't say anything. So I'm thinking, OK, I'm ready to, to get my walking papers. The third day, Harry said, hey, Calhoun, come in my dressing room for a minute after the show. I'm like, okay, I'm a man, I'll take it. I go in the dressing room and he says, I listened to that tape you gave me. And it's just very serious music. And you're gonna have to do that. And that was my first nod from someone I really respect that's been around the block that my freedom of choice, the music that I wanted to play, the music that we were doing was something that was very important. And he said it to me, this is very important music, what you guys are playing here. And this was a live CBGB's cassette. And to be honest with you, I kind of wasn't just afraid anymore of whatever ideas or what somebody thought about me. Some of my friends may feel like I was like that when I was young, and I was to a degree. But when you get around people you respect and they're master musicians or master physicists or professors, sometimes you have this tendency to be a little bit shy about your behavior and how you feel about things. And that was my first moment of never, ever do that again. I never will forget it. Every time I see Harry, I thank him. He jokes about it. But he told me this band and this music is extremely important and you must do it. And he offered me a contract. And I was really young, and it required, it, it included a really good salary, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And 
I had to leave that to go hustle to be in a band that I, what he said is what I was feeling. I was afraid to do it. To be, I'm, I can look you in the eye now and tell you I was a little bit afraid to do that. And he gave me the nod to do it. And that was the beginning of me realizing all of these things that I'm feeling and I'm thinking, I have to pursue because they're important. Not so much about uh, getting a victory or, or, or they're important. And I'll tell you a couple of brief stories within my journeys when these things began. So what put me on the global map of touring, I'll move on, was the success of Living Color, was the, the Grammys, and opening for the Rolling Stones on our first record. Uh, 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 a lot of times you put a record out, in those days it takes you three or four or five record cycles to become famous or make that money back, etc. And success exploded in our, in our face. But I wouldn't have wanted to be with any other guys at that time than Vernon and, and Corey and Muzz because the, the band, I, I, I feel, outside and inside of the band, is a tremendous band. But the best part of the band is the energy within the band. How these conversations about race, politics, sex, gender, whatever, sports, we were, went to head to head. We didn't let anybody get away with anything. And those are the kind of mates you want to have when you're being creative. People that just are like, they hold you to their thoughts and their ideas and they'll listen to yours. That's what the impetus of inspired me to want to be in the band outside of the, the great music. And that was the beginning of, of me realizing something was happening. Because I want to bring into context, at that time, Living Color was blowing up. So was Def Jam Records. So was Spike Lee. Rap music was becoming something else. I went to high school with, with Scott LaRock and KRS-One. These are guys, we, we played basketball together. And then they became icons in that industry that didn't exist. So a lot of things, graffiti was becoming art. <laughs> it was graffiti before. Then it was in museums. And it was, people were paying money to see. We saw amazing art on a handball court. But now it was going to show up in museums. So a lot of things were happening around that time. Vernon and his colleagues started the Black Rock Coalition. Things were changing artistically. It was a renaissance. Things were starting to explode and change and flip. And you saw different things happen that, did, that wasn't happening two years ago. So I want to put that into context. But the traveling allowed me to go places that I never went before. And I I'm the, and Vernon will tell you the guys later. I'm the I'm the kind of guy when we go somewhere I don't like to leave. I stay, I'll stay another two weeks. <laughs> We're in Brazil. Somebody, some drummer tells me on a show, man, have you ever heard Maracatu? Man, it's drumming. This thing is incredible. It's it's from Angola and they only played it for the Queen. And that's all you got to tell me. My ticket gets changed immediately, and I stay because what Harry said it's important. I'm a drummer, I'm conveying his rhythms, I'm conveying his music. I want my vocabulary to be as wide as possible. Wide is the, what's, what's, what makes the, 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 the drumming so infectious? Brief, quick example, everybody I know in the world loves James Brown. Everyone. Anybody here don't like James Brown? Raise your hand if you don't. It's okay if you don't. When I studied with this Nigerian drum master, he was teaching me about rhythm and movement and sound. And he was telling me, oh, well, James Brown, if you take away the notes a little bit, you take the rhythm of what the horns are playing and the rhythm of what the drums are playing and the rhythm of what the guitars are playing, these are all festive Nigerian traditional patterns. This is what you play for a wedding. When a baby's born, when your daughter or son reaches the rites of passage, so Academically, James stacked all of these beautiful, healthy, uh, uh, warm, joyful rhythms together to create his new sound, which if you listen to his music, it changed after a certain period of time in his career. And all of those things stacked together, academically create this wonderful connection with people feeling good, which is what his music does. But it's not that I'm belittling James Brown, I would never do that. He's a genius at what he's done. However, his, and he may not have planned to do it, who knows? But at the end of the day, those, those if, you know, we're, we're here in the university, we're talking about physics and equa those equations of what he put together on what he assigned to those instruments all equal joyfulness and goodness and et cetera. So that's an example, I'm just saying, in that way. And that experience wanted me to understand, taught me what can I learn about my instrument, about the vibrations of my instrument, that I could communicate to people to make them feel good. 
or to make them understand something, or to take away their pain, or these, these kind of things. And that led me on the journey that I'm still on of staying in South America and, and, and being in Brazil and studying Maracatu and studying with masters. And the more I learned, the more I became addicted to it. Um, more recently, in the last 15 years, I've been living a little bit on and off and traveling in Mali, in West Africa. And Mali got under my skin for a lot of reasons. The music did and the culture did, but I had these amazing experiences in, in Mali uh, uh, when it came to music that I was identifying with. And I, I was taught beats for, to create rain, which is not magic and it's not voodoo, it's, it's a vibration. It's a vibrational pattern. When enough people do it at a certain particular time, it creates a reaction, which creates a reaction, which creates a reaction. I talked earlier about, um, I was in one, I was staying in this one uh, 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 tribal area with this family and the daughter of one of the older ladies was pregnant. They announced that she was pregnant and then as soon as the announcement is made, there's a little thing in the, in the main part of the village where these drummers set up in a 180 degree angle around her and they play at a certain distance from her and they play and she s listens and then she gets to this point where she feels something and then that's, they, they stop and it's like, okay, that's, she's going to have a healthy baby now. Done. And these are things that are 40,000 years old. Science, I can't touch what the process is. I've just witnessed it. But that importance of those rhythms and those sounds and that music for me was something that I wanted to sort of get into and research and study. Not only for me to know, but the big thing is how can I put this information into living color, into most deaf, into Farrah Sanders, into Wayne Shaw, into whatever I'm doing musically. What's the injection of this information? Because it's timeless, obviously. It's been done before. It's what happens in science when things vibrate and there's galaxies and there's black holes, et cetera. The information is out there kind of getting bounced around. And that was the beginning of, of, the, of the journey, the, the engagement of being around people and being around cultures, getting this information. It reminded me of the Bronx. It reminded me of my Jewish summer camps. It made me realize that things are universal. But also, information-wise, I feel like if you look at a football game, I think a lot of the West, culturally, in general, it, it, the game starts at the 50-yard line. And, and you can start the game at the 50-yard line and go into the end zone and score a touchdown, and it could be great, but it's almost more important to know how did you get to the 50-yard line. That's where the value is. Where are the things that put you at that point where you start to say, okay, here's where I want to begin my journey. And that's what it was. For me, it was like a reversed kind of a scenario, and the humanity side of it was just, was large. Um, I'll tell you a story. I was driving from Bamako in Mali to Timbuktu. Took about four or five days. We're driving through the desert. It's about 115 degrees, and the tires blow out. And you're in the desert. Now, I'm from the Bronx. I don't know where, what, where to make a left, right, or what have you. And um, I asked my driver, I do all of these journeys alone. I go with just a just a tour guide so I can know how to communicate with people and know us. I don't want to, you know, sometimes as Americans and Europeans, we, we complain, it's hot, it's too many flies. I, I need my medication. I want a hamburger. These kind of things that you can't relate, to. I can't relate to when I'm trying to do this research. Like I can't, I can't hear it. So I always go alone. And um, I said, man, the tires exploded. And the brother said, yeah, man, uh, let's just, just, just wait. And I'm thinking, wait for what? You know, was me gonna be, am I gonna get captured out here? Like, what's going on, you know? And, and about an hour and a half later, six guys come over the hill, and they laugh, and oh, you had a flat tire. Yeah. One guy goes back and gets a couple of more of his brothers. They come, they pick up the truck, put a stone under it, change the tire for us, the truck back down, and in my sort of Western rude way, I go in my wallet, you know, to try to see if I can give them a 50 or 100. Dollars, and the brother said, uh, don't ruin my blessing. Just as silent as you are is how silent I was. He looked me in the eye and said that. Don't ruin my blessing. You guys have a nice trip. And they left. So what does a tip really mean? We just needed help. We got help and they bounced. No, nothing attached to it at all. 
that was a situation of change massively for me. I mentioned another one where I was in the outback of Australia, totally loving that experience. That was the first place I went where I felt I was on a planet. I couldn't sleep the first couple of nights because I didn't know what silence was. I thought I knew. When I was in the outback, it's silent. And the sky looks like it's on fire when the sun's going down. It looks like flames are in the sky. When the sun goes down, it's littered with stars. Something I can't fathom, never seen in a painting. Like the first five days I was just, they were probably laughing at me. I was going, damn, damn. Whoa. It was like, everything was so incredible. So I'm there two or three, four weeks, getting this information from a brother named Vince, who I know really well. And you should look this gentleman up. I'll give you the name. His name is Jagamara. Jagamara is one of the most famous Aboriginal painters and artists in the world. And Jagamara turned me on to his, his family, and the family took me out to the outback, and that's where I began this, this kind of journey. And um, I'm, I'm, I don't know, three, four, five months in now, and I'm, I'm around the elders, which you're not supposed to speak around the elders. You, they, 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 speak, they speak to you, and at sundown is when conversations begin. So we're there, fire. They, they make two fires. They make a sleeping fire, which is about 20 feet tall because it burns really slowly and you sleep around it in a cooking fire, which is what you cook the food in. And um, the oldest guy, who's really just had a cool smirk, he just looked like a cool jazz musician. The oldest guy, he comes, he comes over to me. And at this time, this was the 90s, Vernon and Mel, there was this style of jewelry that was, so I had one of these watches with a, it was really chrome, kind of hip hop looking, and it had a guy, had a figure of a guy, like a stick figure of a guy running. Someone, Keith Herring kind of vibe. So um, he's looking at my watch, this old guy. And he's looking at it, he's pointing at it, I'm thinking to myself, I'm gonna have to give this old man my watch, you know, but I don't wanna do that if he asks for it. So he, so he, he says, uh, brother, what, what's that? And I said, this, he goes, yeah, what is that? I said, it's a watch. He said, it's a watch. What does that do? I said, it tells time. I said, that machine tells time? I said, yeah, it tells time. He said, tell me how it works. How does it work for you? I said, oh, let me explain. You know, I'm a musician. And if I have a session at 3 o'clock, maybe I wake up at 11, have my breakfast at 12, I get out of the house at 1, I get there by 2, set up my gear, and at 3 o'clock, we begin the session. He said, that machine gets everybody into the same place at the same time? That's an incredible machine. And that was my sign to take the watch off. Because it's not possible for a session to really start at three o'clock where everybody's on time and everything. It doesn't happen in life, right? Neither does class, right? Neither do appointments. So when I took it off and I put it away, which for him meant that I got what he was saying to me, he said, young man, time is here and here and everything in between. That was it. That was my lesson for that entire trip. And he didn't want me to think about things in yesterdays, in last weeks, and three o'clocks, because it's not real. Now, their paintings, if you look at their paintings, are called dream time. And I asked him why they're called dream time. And he said, because when you're dreaming, you don't have any control over the environment. You could go to the store with your grandmother that died 20 years ago, and then you could get married to a person you never met yet in the same dream. And you don't have any control over it until you wake up. You might scream, you might want to wake up, you might be paranoid, it might be something tragic, but you have no control over it. When you're awake, you can start controlling your environment. Can't have the cheesecake, it's too fattening. I'm a vegetarian, can't have the steak. I want to buy those shoes, but they're $500, doesn't fit into my budget. Or I'm gonna buy those shoes and just not eat next week. You're controlling your environment. You're controlling your creativity. You're controlling your knowledge. You're controlling your experiences. When you sleep, you cannot do that. And that's why for them, the dream time paintings are important because they're examples and revelations of what's real to them. So I say these stories and these things just for you to get an idea on 
what it meant for me to take these journeys. And I'm learning about all of this music and all of these rhythms and all of this sound, but there's also all of these life lessons that are involved. And everything's connected. It's not a drum research camp. It's not a rhythmic analysis class. It's not the history of tribal drumming. You know, all of these people in all of these times are trying to get me to separate those ideas to understand what life's about. And I want to be short on time. I wanna, might want to play you something as well. Um, um, when I was in Mali, I worked with this great singer named Umu Sangari. Love Umu. Love it a bit because Umu exposed me to so much music. And Umu gave me a cassette once. This old, the cassette was turning yellow. She said, listen to this. I said, okay. I was in Mali. The bar had a boom box, put the cassette in there, and it was this traditional music played by the hunters. The hunters are these Malian brothers, their families. They have this instrument called the Huntin Ngoni. It's a long instrument with six strings on it, and you sing, and you play this instrument, and there's a little metal bell you scrape, which creates a clave. And the rhythm is cha, 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 cha. Ja 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 ja. Everything's built on that rhythm. So I heard this music and I, you know, I'm freaking out like, oh, this is incredible. Came back to the Bronx. I still have a cassette player in my truck, by the way. And I played the cassette. Couldn't stop playing it four or five, six months in a row. I went back to Miley and I said, ooh, I wanna, I wanna record with the Hunters. She said, no, they don't, they don't, they don't even play with me. They don't play with outside musicians. It's spiritual music. Even the politicians, everyone's afraid of them because their vibration creates truth. It makes people feel uncomfortable because the music strips you. The rhythm of the music and the sound it strips you of all your little things. So they stay out in the bush. And I said, well, I, I don't know. I wasn't satisfied with that answer. So this one village called Bendi Bendiagara, I went up north and um, I went to talk to some of the master drummers and I was like, man, I'm trying to, and, they, and, they, and you know, you don't want to come off like the American of like, yeah, well, you know, I need, I need five of those, <laughs> three of these and two of these. I'm going to bag them up because I got a flight to catch. It's not the deal. So I would go there and ask, and they would just look at me. Oh, yeah, you want, you? And they would go, you want to hook up with the Dundas? Uh, you want to hook up with the Dundas? Okay. And you're waiting for an answer. It doesn't happen. So I went back to that village four times a year for four years asked the same question, went to the same place, no result. I'm in the market on my fifth trip, and uh, this kid walks up to me in a moped, comes up to me in a moped, he goes, hey, you Will Calhoun? Said, yeah, he goes, uh, so-and-so wants you to go to this cultural center. They have a recording studio there, you want to go. We need, we, you need to be over there, you need to go over there. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, okay. And I went, and there were two hunters with their instruments at this, at this recording studio, cultural center. And I'm, I'm blown away. And they're so traditional, they, the brother says, I heard you wanted to, me to play with me. So he just started playing and singing. And I was trying to, I didn't want to stop him, but I was trying to say like, yo, can we go, can we do that in the studio? Can we take that? <laughs> so they played and I just listened and it was transforming. Then I explained to him what I wanted to do. And he said, okay went in the recording studio and he was very demanding about what rhythm I had to play to play with these guys. I'm just trying to cut the story down. So we go in the studio. I, I'll, I'll play you the tracks so you can hear it. And I, I, I'm in the studio and I cut this track and I play it. And um, I'm excited because I always wanted to play with the hunters and they told me what it was like and how they play before they hunt, etc. So I'm kind of feeling all good afterwards and, the, and the, one of the brothers comes up to me, he goes, oh, you know, there's a uh, six-stage initiation to play this music with us, right? So then I'm frozen. <laughs> I'm thinking, uh, there is? Nobody told me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> really? And uh, he says, do you want to know what those are? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, I, have, I don't want to know. And he said, um, let's just say, you know, us inviting you is the seventh. And I was, I mean, I can't explain to you being a fan of music when you hear something that you really want to do. As an artist, you don't 
You don't divorce yourself from that feeling, ever. You just feel like, I have to get, it's a sound, it's a thing, I have to be involved in this. And it took, it took you know, those 16 trips, it's four years, four times a year, going, of going. I didn't, I was, I'm going to figure it out, I'm going to find a way, I know I'm not from here. And so many great Malians told me, it's not, they're not going to, they don't do it, man. They don't. But I, I wanted it. And I'm saying that as an example, spiritually inside of you, if you really have something that you want to do, the rules are really yours at the end of the day. They're going to implement to you what, because I was told it never happens. Obviously, it has, or if that was the first time for that particular family, fine. But that was a point for me of sort of, it was a rites of passage for me in that I was listening to this music for so long and I had this opportunity. So all of those experiences and all of these types of music and styles, I feel it took a lot of things in the West and artists like these guys that I work with to get me to those places. It was very important for me to get those places to them. Like that was the next thing I had to bring back to the table. Even if it's just conversation, it doesn't have to be on a drum kit. And those experiences taught me that, you know, how one, we're, how much of really one kind of a people we are how many things are similar, and very little things actually make us different, including gender, at the end of the day. Um, going from a minister's house where there's servants, and they're serving you tea, and you, you, somebody rings a bell, and you order your fish, all the way down to staying with families that had dirt floors, and I slept on them. And they had the same dignity and intelligence and brilliance as the so-called royal families had. I had both experiences sometime in the same trip. So it was really important for me to understand what does it mean to have dignity and to be intelligent and to be, uh, uh, there, there is no kind of an academic necessarily hook that you can hang that hat on other than your spirit. That's where it is at the end of the day. And that's something nobody can take from you. They can judge you, they can give you a grade on the paper. A critic can say our record sucks. That's all, to me, that's just all outside interference on a level. You know, the reality is you have the experience. The reality is you do something with that experience. Because we're all passing. We're all on this time, for, you know, whatever. Um, I lost my father two years ago, New Year's Eve. And my father and I had a, had a, had a, uh, a, a challenging relationship, to say the least. But it was cool. It was, we were dealing. And, you know, we had this thing where we, I would talk to him. And I got to this point in my life where I said to him, you know, Something's going to either happen to me or you. And if it happens to you, I don't want to be the one staying, hanging around feeling bad. Or I didn't do this, I didn't do that. So we could park all of that and we can start from here and just deal with from here on. And that's what happened. And the thing that I realized when he passed, the first thought that came to me was, whatever you don't do doesn't happen. In your mind, you can sing that tune, you can play out the role, you can create that theory, you can dance that dance, but it's in your mind. And sometimes we have a tendency to become afraid, or oh, that's a safe place to keep it, or oh, that's the best place where it works, is in your mind. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't actually happen. And you can convince yourself that it does. I thought about this so many times. I, well, it happened to me. I experienced it. It's not the same thing. So whatever's going on in your mind, whatever's going on in your spirit, whatever anyone that you, you have to do it for it to happen. The impact begins upon the action. That's when it all starts. That's when it all, all of those trips to, to with, the, with the hunters really began after the recording. And this gentleman said to me, there's six rites of passage. My ego was like, I got it, I got it. I got it on my hard job, I'm cool. And there I was standing outside, looking out like, ah, and this guy came up behind me. I'll tell you another experience like that. I was studying with this master drummer and we were in town and a tour bus comes in with Americans. And the Americans are getting off the bus, loud as hell, too much luggage. 
really bright clothes, they move in a certain kind of a way. And me being in Mali all of this time, I'm looking at them like, damn, these people are, these folks are stiff. And I'm sitting here going, man, man. And the old man walks up behind me and he goes, I remember when you looked like that, when you came here for the first time. And you kind of, you know, your neck just got, eh. <laughs> it's just this thing. But he was laughing at it because he appreciated that I recognized that, that situation. So we are short on time. Um, I did have some things I wanted to show you. I'm gonna let this, this I think what I, I wanted to show you a little bit of some, some photos about some of the stories, but more importantly, I would like to play you this Hunter track just so you can hear. Would you rather hear something like that so you can hear what it sounds like? Yeah. It's a really beautiful thing, and the two, there's two guys that sing together. It's not really like harmony. One's playing uh, uh, the bell. One's playing Hunting and Goni. They're singing together. I'm playing drum set, and there's a bass player who missed his flight and was all the way out there in, 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 uh, in, in the desert getting ready to do, go back to, to Mali, and he happened to be, and I found this guy to play bass on it, and, and this, is the, this is the track. I'll, I'll put it up so you can hear it. Hey, 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 hey. This is giving me a hard time here. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Here it is. That's the, that's the eighth uh, right of passage. to hear that. I see some people already kind of going into a trance. <laughs> but that's the idea with the music. That's the, the idea of this music is to, it's trance based. And it's, and, and they're singing about positive things that are happening in their village and, and rhythmically they're dealing with you stripping yourself down from defensive ideas and thoughts and letting things happen to you organically and naturally. And that's what that, that line, that melody, da -da 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 -da, that it's almost like a sing-along kind of thing. That's the idea. So I wanted to play you that, and, and, and thank you so much for having me up here and inviting thank me over. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Saffron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to invite the whole panel now to come on up and, uh, and join us up here in the front. So, Will, you can right. take a seat. And uh, I want to invite Melvin and Vernon. 
and as they're coming up, uh, yeah, watch, watch out for this. Watch your step, exactly. Let me uh, introduce our the rest of the panel now, and you know, every now and again, there are folks that I'm called on to introduce, and it's it's hard to put together an introduction for them. And in the case of Vernon and Melvin, you know, they are so multifaceted, they're ruthlessly eclectic, and it makes it hard to pigeonhole them and hard to classify them, and therefore hard to introduce them. They stretch you. They really do. The more I've been sort of learning about their work, the more I, I discover, and it's like, wow, and it's always been a surprise. It's like going around another corner. So I'll start with, uh, with Melvin. Um, Melvin, this is his third time at Brown in the last four or five months. I think he's starting to be, he's on the tenure track now. Um, some of you have saw him when he was last here just a month or so ago, a couple weeks ago actually, for a panel on, on George Gershwin and Gershwin Reimagined and so forth. But Melvin is a, a bass guitarist, a composer and a producer. He's appeared on some 200 albums in a broad, broad array of different genres of music. He's been called, quote, the best bassist in the world by Time Out New York. And just to give you a sense of, of the range of, of musicians that he's performed with and recorded with, the Rollins Band, which I think of as, you know, an iteration of, of punk rock, uh, Milton Nascimento, the great Brazilian troubadour, Femi Kuti, the great Nigerian, well, the son of, of uh, Fela Kuti, one of Fela Kuti's sons, and I think of Afropop, David Byrne, and the great jazz uh, vocalist and, and composer Cassandra Wilson. He has, and I recommend it very much, an amazing album, uh, 2009, I think, Ancient Speak. And this is sampling the music of the African diaspora in the Caribbean as well as in the northeast of Brazil. Features a, a friend who's been to Brown a couple of times, uh, the Afro-Cuban percussionist Pedrito Martinez. And Melvin headed to Brazil, to Salvador de Bahia, and working with the producer and guitarist Arthur Lindsay, he made hours of field recordings that became the heart of the tracks on Ancient Speak. It's a wonderful product and sort of brings to life a musical triangle linking or relinking, I should say, Salvador de Bahia, La Habana, Cuba, and Brooklyn, with all apologies to the Bronx. Uh, so check it out. Vernon Reed, Vernon is a guitarist. He was listed as one of the best 100 guitarists of all time by Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> He's best known as the founder and primary songwriter of the rock group Living Color, which won two Grammys, including uh, a 1990 Grammy for their 1988 mega hit, Cult of Personality. When I ask undergraduates, some of them are here from my class, you know, you ever heard of Living Color, the band? No. Do you know the song Cult of Personality? Yeah. They know the song. Well, Living Color is really the, the tip of the proverbial iceberg in Vernon's case. Let me read a quote to you from encyclopedia.com. Quote, but to recognize Reed, Vernon Reed, solely for his Grammy Award winning work as a rock musician would be to miss a rich and varied body of work that has extended into virtually every musical genre, end quote. So before Living Color, he performed with Melvin Gibbs, in fact, with the experimental avant-garde jazz drummer Ronald Shannon Jackson's group, the Decoding, Decoding Society, which has been called, quote, the wildest fusion band of the 80s. In 1985, you've heard some references to the Black Rock Coalition. Vernon co-founded the Black Rock Coalition together with, among others, Greg Tate, a journalist who actually uh, was a visiting professor of Africana Studies here at Brown fairly recently taught a course entitled The History of Afrofuturism 
and black science fiction. And hopefully uh, Vernon will follow in his footsteps and we can, we can lure him to teach a course. You can think about titles. Um, let me say something about the Black Rock Coalition. With concerts, manifestos, and creative support to rock musicians, the BRC aimed to break down the stereotypes facing blacks in the music business and also to remind audiences that rock music has very deep African-American roots. Living Color, the band Living Color was the coalition's flagship band, but I also think of Fishbone, some of you may know as another uh, leading figure in this movement. And Vernon told Rolling Stone magazine in 1989, quote, it's not about now we got through the door, close the door behind us, and, end quote. Um, well, continuing the quote, actually. What I hope our success is doing is encouraging other black rock bands to stick with it, end quote, from 1989. Um, he also founded in 2000 the Healing Hands Percussion Circle, which Will participated in, uh, I believe. This occurred when Reed saw a photograph of two victims of the Civil War in Sierra Leone during that time, one of a, a photo of a young man staring at the camera holding a child in his arms and both the young man and the child had had their hands amputated. Uh, amputation was carried out by one of the, the armed, well, uh, rebel, rebel forces during the time. That time there were elections that this group was opposed to having held and one of the slogans of the election to help get out the vote was the future is in your hands. So in response to this slogan, uh, they began strategically amputating hands as a form of intimidation. And uh, the symbolism of the drum circle, you know, one can imagine this was a way to drum for those who could not drum for themselves and to raise funding and awareness about them. As a guitarist, Vernon's had a prolific session output, played live on record with Mick Jagger, Public Enemy, Janet Jackson, I can go on and on, the late Bernie Worrell of Parliament Funkadelic, the late Jack Bruce, frontman of King of uh, Cream, with B.B. King, who recently, well, has an honorary degree from Brown University, with Santana, who I hope will have an honorary degree from Brown University very soon. He's also a producer. He went to Bamako, the capital of Mali, to produce an album with the acclaimed Malian singer Salif Keita in 1996. He's produced the Mexican new metal group Resorte, et cetera, et cetera. And we're lucky to get both of them here, I say uh, Will and Vernon, because they're literally between, well, in Vernon's case, between Carnegie Hall gigs. So Vernon was uh, performing at Carnegie Hall just last month, as part of the Songs of Change um, event featuring Dionne Warwick, among others, celebrating the music of the 1960s that helped to propel movements for social justice. And I gather Vernon and Will are playing at Carnegie Hall uh, soon, again, this weekend, as part of the annual Carnegie Hall uh, tribute concert to benefit music education for underprivileged youth. And the theme this year is the music of Led Zeppelin. Okay, so enough of introducing. Let's turn it over and let me invite Melvin and Vernon to, uh, to comment on what Will offered us. Well, before we start, I'm going to make one small correction since everything's oh, on film moment. these yeah, days. Uh, I actually, actually haven't played with Milton Nascimento yet, but I have played hmm. with the person that Quincy Jones shouted out when I asked him about great musicians, which is Caetano Veloso. So, uh, as far as what Will talked about, I mean, so many things. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm just going off the top, so this is another one of these semi-fragmented things that I'll, I'll tie up at the end. Uh, thinking in terms of musical experiences that really affected me on a deep level beyond the guys at this table. <laughs> The, the one that probably affected me the most was one I actually didn't get paid for. And that has to do, as uh, Richard mentioned us, I did a, a lot, of, part of my record was recorded in Salvador by Brazil. 
And for a while, I was spending a lot of time going down there. And I guess it was the second time I went down there. Uh, that was a very interesting year, because that was actually the year Michael Jackson was down there. And um, he was down there to shoot the remix video of his song, They Don't Really Care About Us. And he went down there to one shoot in the favelas in Salvador and in Rio, and to two, record this remix with a drum group in Brazil, which is, you know, one of my two favorite, one of my three favorite drum groups in the world, and a group called Ola Doom that's based out of Salvador de Bahia. Yep. And uh, it just so happened that I got to play, to backstory this a little bit, I actually started off, before I started playing bass, I actually started off as a percussionist. So I still have, I still have my rudimentary percussion skills. Uh, and it so happened I was in a, sitting in a bar in the neighborhood of Salvador where these guys are located with Arlo's Lindsay brothers who happened to be their ex-tour manager. And a person who's a seminal person in Brazilian music, a man named Neguim du Samba, who, was at, who at that time was the drum leader of Ola Doom, like what they call the mestre. He was the man who was in charge. He made up the rhythms. He rehearsed the band. You know, he, he was a very powerful person in the context of that music. And to backstory that before he was the leader of this group, Ola Doom, he was started off with, with the group, which is actually my favorite group down, which is a group called Ili Aye. And he actually made up these rhythms that people think of when they think of a certain era of music from Brazil. These, these rhythms came out what they call well, what they call samba reggae, which we we would call sam samba reggae. He actually made this fusion of music and developed these rhythms and taught them to these hundreds of people. And it's this thing that's going all around the world the same way graffiti did out of the Bronx or hip hop did. It's this thing that came from this neighborhood that disseminated everywhere. Anyway, happened to be sitting at you know at the restaurant and here comes Nagyom and. Otto's brother starts talking to him and he tells him, hey, Melvin's a musician, he'd like to work with you sometime. And I'm kind of like, backstory, further backstory, I didn't really speak Portuguese at that point. I do a little bit now. Uh, so Nagim so asks him, uh, says something to, uh, to, to Otto's brother, and Otto's brother's like, okay. I said, so what did he say? He said, hey, yeah. He said, he asked if you played an instrument. He, he asked if you played percussion. And I told him, yes. He said, okay, tell him to be at uh, such and such a place at 8 o'clock. So, showed up at such and such a place at eight o'clock. It turned out to be all the doom rehearsal. So they gave me a bass drum, <laughs> and they were like, "This one's for you." So I got in the in, in the in the formation with the the big it was like a hundred dudes. I got in the formation with them. Went over the little you know they have a couple of breaks that you need to learn. Learn the break, and then you know main rhythm, and then. That was it, right? So after that, I had to go shopping because you're wearing this drum for eight hours and you're going to lose skin on your legs. So they, all the guys have this, they wear these, the, thing, the soccer goalie uh, pads on their legs so they can walk around with this drum on fire. So we go to the mall and we buy the, sh buy the soccer goalie stuff. And uh, so the next day I show up, no, the, Oh, and he gave me this, I love the part I left out is he, he gave me this card, which I still have in my house, which is his signature and the word mestri, which was the, the card. And I, the next day I showed up with the card and that card was what allowed the guy who was in charge of the drums to give me a drum, you know? And there were, the backstory of this, there were guys who flew home from Europe because this was carnival and was the main thing. And some of these guys didn't have the card, so they didn't get their drum. So it, it, was, it was an intense thing. So anyway, I pick up the drum, and I'm standing there, and there's a bunch of guys there, and they're, they start laughing. And I'm kind of like, what are you laughing at? And it so happened that Duncan, I, Duncan was with, with me at that point to, to translate, because I still didn't speak any Portuguese. And he said, you're not going to, he said, they're laughing because you're not going to last. And I'm kind of like, what did he mean you're not going to last? He said, you're going to be out there for eight hours. So, theoretically, 
although they were supposed to go out at 10 o'clock. But this is Brazilian time, so I guess somewhere around 12.30, we hit the street. There's a whole section, probably around between 3 and 5, that I don't remember at all. <laughs> that, well, you know, but it was this amazing situation of, you know, we're out, of, we're playing on the street, you know, it's literally all the Brazils out there, the whole city singing along with these songs, it was just this really incredible feeling. The girlfriends are weaving in and out, dancing, it's just this whole thing. And like I said, there's a whole period where I don't remember anything. And I remember, well, I do remember at one point the band stopped. And I'm kind of like, what's going on? And we kind of stopped and we kind of plan along in place. And then what happened, now this is, we're, we're heading towards sunrise now, we're like six, seven in the morning. At that point, this door opened and it was like the reviewing area, the part where you get on TV. So we're six hours into this thing and then we get to the TV part. But the thing that was amazing is that you could feel this energy. It's like everybody kicked their energy up a level. So, because they were all going to be on TV and this was their moment. And it just, because you got 100 people kicking their energy up, okay, you're going to kick your energy up too. So we come out and then there's all the, and there's the TV cameras and, you know, the next level of dancing and all of that. And we were in there for a while and we come out the other side, we go around the corner and we're done. And I was kind of like, and the guys come, hey, the, all the guys were laughing at me, gave me a hug or whatever. They're like, you made it, dude. We, you know. But the one thing about it was my hand, playing the bass drum, my hand was stuck like this <laughs> for like three hours afterwards. And it's one of them things where it was a great experience. I have no desire to do it again. <laughs> so that's, you know, I, I pass it on to you, Mr. So, so um, hearing these stories from my two colleagues, you know, I'm really struck at um, with what extraordinary lives we've been able to lead and what extraordinary things we've all experienced. Um, you know, Will spoke of being in Bamako, Mali, and I spent some time in Bamako, Mali with Salif Keita, and it really is an extraordinary city. Um, I've also been to Salvador de Bahia, and it's also a remarkable place. And, um, when I think about these things that we've shared, and we've had different experiences, of course, but thinking about knowing two people for, for a really long time and how amazing it is, uh, the places that music has taken us, it's been very unlikely. I, I can't stress to you enough how unlikely our journey has been. We were dudes in the neighborhood. We were dudes in our neighborhoods like other dudes in our neighborhood. And because we had good parenting and uh, because we were children of our time and we were exposed to remarkable things and because our aesthetics grew because we were exposed to amazing things because we had official and unofficial teachers who turned us on to things. I, I have to say, there's a teacher who is not a, I went to Brooklyn Technical High School, it's not a music school, and there was a teacher, uh, Dr. Jean Gee, who was a saxophonist, um, who uh, played with the Sam Rivers Ensemble, and he came to Brooklyn Tech and he played us records after school. And they had like one of these, uh, you know, they had all kind of programs back in the day to keep kids off drugs, you know, whatever, you know. So they had like this little thing where you would go after school and, and uh, they had an actual psychologist and, uh, and, and a counselor who had uh, been an ex-addict. And um, somehow or other, I wound up hanging out with some musicians that I met, and I had started playing guitar a little bit. And these, some of these people,
turned out to be some of the most important people in my life because um, they were just real. They were just true. They really, really were great. I mean that to say uh, one of those people is E.J. Rodriguez. Um, he's a Puerto Rican guy and a percussionist. And the first female musician I ever met was a woman named Carmen, a young woman named Carmen. And uh, it was a guy named Archie. So Archie, Carmen, and EJ used to bring their kungas into the lunchroom. And they would play like Juan Juan Cos, this Puerto Rican rhythm, in the lunchroom. And that was, it was an amazing thing. It was, they weren't supposed to be doing that. So they would always wind up in the dean's office, you know. They, you know, we had a, a lot of us wound up in the dean's office. And uh, this teacher, Gene Gee, he, um, the first time I heard John Coltrane was his teacher. And he played my favorite things. Now, when I went to Catholic school, they heard us, they took us to Radio City to see the sound of music. So I remember the song, Julie Andrews, you know, the hills are along the sound of music, you know, and uh, da 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 you know, one of, the, one of the standout songs from that thing was, you know, my favorite things. You, it's, a, it's, a, it's a song you would remember. It's a very strong melody. So years later, this really hip, you know, goatee, Afro guy plays John Coltrane playing my favorite things. And my mind was blown because I didn't know that a song that I knew could be completely different but the same. And the thing that struck me was uh, the sincerity of, of John Coltrane playing the melody. Like I felt like he really loved the song. I felt like the song was important to him. Like he really took on the lyric, you know, John Coltrane, you know, when you know when the dog barks, when the bee stings, when I'm feeling bad. I simply remember my favorite thing. Like he played to that. He wasn't blowing over it to blow over it. He picked that song because that lyric got in him and it moved him. And because it moved him, it moved my teacher and it moved me. And it was the beginning of a change in the way music occurred to me. I, I, I came up listening to pop music and music on the radio, you know. And uh, to hear things that were different like that, I, I'd never heard that. And then I, you know, I also was lucky that I had classmates that were like, oh man, you like that? You should hear Moments Notice, or you should hear, you should hear A Love Supreme. And uh, he also played Mungo Santa Maria mm playing Mon the Mungo Santa Maria version of Cold Sweat. And he went and he played Mungo Santa Maria's version of Cold Sweat and he put on James Brown version of Cold Sweat. And so this was, I, because I was at an impressionable age, this, these experiences left, they changed, they altered, they shifted what music meant for me. In a, in a fundamental way. And I had spirit guides. I had people who said, man, well, if you like that, you should check out this. You know, I'd start playing guitar because, you know, I, I heard Carlos Santana, you know, playing Black Magic Woman. And a friend of mine said, man, Carlos Santana's bad, man. You should hear this guy, Jimi Hendrix. And I remember seeing Jimi Hendrix on the Dick Cavett show. So I was too young to, to have, you know, I was too young for all of the stuff that he did. You know, it was after he had passed. But somebody, is, I can't remember this guy from the lunchroom, you know, he said, you should hear the band of gypsies. And so, you know, I went and got the record and I heard Machine Gun. And Machine Gun altered reality. I can't overstate that. I felt, when I listened to Machine Gun in my parents' basement, I felt what the war in Vietnam was like. There's something about that song. You know, Jimi Hendrix is beloved by veterans because number one, he was a paratrooper, him and Billy Cox. And 
they knew that, you know, Jimmy and Billy knew, but for, you know, but by the grace, they did their time, you know, they would have been in it. And, um, you know, Jimi Hendrix is associated with the hippies, and, you know, Jimi Hendrix was very ambivalent about the hippies. I mean, he was, he was betwixt in between. You know, when in six was nine, if the hippies cut off all their hair, I don't care. You know, he, he, you know, anyway, long story short, this was a crazy thing. It was, it was a very visual experience hearing Machine Gun and the feedback and the noise and the whole thing. All this stuff now, we've heard it a bazillion times and it was a brand new thing for me. And all of that led to a singular desire at a certain point in my life and that was to find out what it would be like to be myself playing the guitar, whatever that meant. And that took me on a journey that led somehow to me and Melvin Gibbs being in a band together. And that led to me at an invitation from Melvin to hear Ronald Shannon Jackson. And that led to me hearing James Blood Omer, which I, I didn't know, I had no context for what that was, which led me to hearing Sonny Chirac. And it led to, <laughs> it led to uh, this, I mean, these incredible things. And it was all from, and I'm skipping a lot of things like, like my classmate Raymond Jones, who was, when we were, 16, I asked him, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And Raymond Jones looked at me and said, I am a piano player. And things like that change your life. They changed my life. The fact that this person, you know, we're kids, we don't know. We don't, what do we know? He looked at me dead ass and said, I am a piano player. He was sent to Brooklyn Tech because his parents were not going to send him to music and art. It was like he was a smart guy. They did not want him to be doing that. And he beat the odds. And I'll tell you something else about that. Y'all know the song Good Times by Sheik? That's, that's actually a song that's credited with the beginning of hip hop, you know, because rap is delight. So when you hear Sheik, you hear, oh, it's very layered. You'll hear. Acoustic piano and you hear Fender Rhodes. Well, the person playing the Fender Rhodes part on that record is Raymond Jones, who I went to high school with. And things like that said, you know, it's, it's, it's freaky, but it's possible. It could, these unlikely things can happen. So there's never been a guarantee of anything. And, you know, when I first heard, when I first met Will Calhoun, he's a very earnest young man. <laughs> Very earnest, you know. He was really uh, enthusiastic. And to hear William talk about his journey, it's an extraordinary thing. From my perspective on Will, I've seen him grow into, from just, a, you know, from being a talented drummer to becoming a world-class musician to becoming a world-class percussionist I've watched him become an amazing songwriter. Uh, I've seen him become uh, a very cultured person. He's, he is a tea snob. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> he is a complete, he is, he's sick with it. But it's like, it's extraordinary to see someone, you know, who was like, you know, he used to like, you know, that the purple Kool-Aid. And, <laughs> and see, that person become an extraordinary man. And I remember seeing the band I and I. The Black Rock Coalition started because really I went to an I and I gig and there was nobody in the room. And I was like, this is something is wrong. Something is wrong. I and I is the first band outside. And really, was the first rock band to have a DJ as a regular member, the first one, right? That's right. And so ahead of its time. 
And, and this led to a round of phone calls. I just started calling people. It wasn't like, the, the founding of the Black Rock Coalition was really just calling friends. Like, yo, man. And we got together, and um, we just started asking questions. And it was really a, a head check. I called people to check my head. Say, is it, you know, basically, is it me? <laughs> sometimes you got to check your head. You know, sometimes you got to ask somebody. Sometimes you really got to ask, yo, yo, is it me? And maybe the answer is, yeah, it's you. Or maybe it's like, no, nah, it's not you, which was basically what I got from Greg Tate and Craig Street and Condon Mason. You know, it's, um, you know, I've been on stage. We've been on stage open for Rolling Stones. I say this, you know, that's special, but it's no more special. I, and I mean this. It's, it's, being on stage open for Rolling Stones is not more special than being here with y'all, to me. And I don't care if you get that or not, but it really is true. It really is true because what it took for us to be here <laughs> is unbelievable, but it happened. And so the thing about it is possibility, you know. I can't guarantee all of y'all have dreams and all of y'all are in different places in all of your lives. You know, some of y'all may be thinking about writing a book, some of y'all might be thinking about this, some of y'all might be thinking about taking a trip, whatever y'all doing or not doing. But the one thing all of this is about is that shit really is possible. Why Earth? There doesn't have to be life on this planet. Start from that premise. Start from there. Speaking of um, starting, um, yeah. so yeah. So um, for the rest of this um, conversation, we're going to slightly shift um, the format a little bit. So the way it's going to happen, I'm going to moderate a conversation. Um, we have about, I would say, 15 minutes to do that. And the idea is that we're just going to like just make, instead of speaking, since everyone had a chance to kind of speak, um, the sort of long, long form, we're just going to get a conversation. And then Richard is um, going to come up and ask one final question to the three, to the three guys. The final question. Yeah. You're not sure there's going to be time for questions. You want to do the questions now? No. Wait, wait. No, 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 no. Wait, wait. Okay. Open it up. I don't have a question. Right. So, yeah. So, I'm... Um, <laughs> That's right. I don't so think anybody we, wants we to go. We're gonna have um, yeah. We'll yeah. stick with Plan A for right now, right? Yeah, Pass so out the menus, please. So um, if if that being the case, we actually did that. Right. But I I have I do I do have an important um question to position actually for the three of you. Oh, okay. Um, since we did kind of like prepare some things ahead of time. Yeah. Um, and and we did t uh, you know we spoke at length about some issues that I do want to bring to the table. Um, right. So the first thing I just wanted like, you know, open out was, um, so the Black Rock Coalition, just to give some context, I was in college, I was um, one of um, five African American men at, um, at a place called Haverford College. And during that time, it was like in the 80s, I forget, like late 80s, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be very honest, I mean, we're all from New York City, I'm from the Bronx. I did not grow up with the idea that rock music was something that black people did. I kid you not, I, I'm not, maybe I was sheltered. Mm -hmm. And we did, you know, it was hip hop music and funk music. I didn't really understand, of course, the history. Mm -hmm. So when, when um, Fishbone came out and Living Color came out, my friends, my black friends, and also some of my, my white friends were just like, who are these guys doing this stuff, all right? All right? All right. So I guess my question, to answer to that young person and my, my friends during that time, mm -hmm. um, we were, of course, about, uh, we also, it felt more like, wow, I don't have to be in this musical box, in this musical pigeonhole. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what you guys did for us. My question to you guys, I mean all of you, um, is what were the conditions that kind of, you know, in that context, that led to the Black Rock Coalition to live in color, and also what Melvin, you know, the fact that Melvin was also in the orbit as well. Well, I'll, I'll just say, say real brief, you know, it was, it was like there were a lot of, um, it was very hard to book shows. You know, there was a, there was a very, there was a burgeoning, you know, New York, there was a lively rock scene in New York at that time. And there were actually a lot of clubs. And it was really like, it was very hard 
to you know to to book shows if your bands were led by African Americans. So you could maybe be if you were not the leader, quote unquote. The band wasn't yours. You could be a side man, but it was very very difficult to um, to do stuff if if you weren't a side man. And um, basically, it was a f seeing a bunch of gigs of people the bands that I knew were great, and just seeing how. You know, it, the attendance was bad. It was you know, it was very hard to even get a show. And when the dialogue started, we were very fortunate in that the the uh, we keep coming up to CBGBs. The uh, the owner of that club, Hilly Crystal, he was he at one time was a, the manager of the Vanguard. So he was around when Coltrane was playing at the Vanguard and things like that. And he was very receptive to the idea because of course he was also because he was an impresario. Um, and uh, he 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 really took on you know booking the bands and even doing some of the festival things that the uh, coalition was doing. But you know it started out really w as a, a a questioning about what's the definition, what are the definitions, what are the limits of black music, and the thing about it is. In, in essence, we never, you know, the rock and roll music, and there's a very definite thing that happened in radio. I can say in New York, well, there was a, a, the, the rise of FM consultancy. There was a person that was responsible for changing the, uh, changing the landscape of radio. And that was Lee Abram. He's an FM consultant, and he came up with this whole idea of uh, removing, like, uh, removing African American elements from rock radio, and it was a very, you know, and marketing it to white males between the age of 15 to 25. That was a definite thing that happened. And you know, at, at one point, you would hear on WNEW, which was a rock radio station at that time, you would hear because um, they had free form radio, so you would hear DJs would play James Brown. They would play, you know, R&B records. They would play Screaming Jay Hawkins. You heard it alongside a Led Zeppelin. I, rem I distinctly remember a DJ playing Led Zeppelin's The Crunch and then playing Papa Don't Take No Mess. That happened as a regular thing. It, you know, uh, on, on, on black radio, I, uh, on like a BLS, I, I would hear Billy Cobham's record, Spectrum, the record he did after he played with the Ma Vishnu Orchestra. That would happen as a regular thing. When the consultants came in, that was kind of the end of kind of uh, DJs being mavericks. DJs used to be on radio. They would, uh, you know, uh, especially on FM, less than on AM, they would have a free hand. And that was actually taken away. And that was the result of that was that the radios became, radios became very, very segregated. Mm. Very, very segregated. And, and, the, and the coalition was really an outgrowth of a series of meetings among artists. And you know, the, I'll tell you this, the, the, the idea of it being the, the coalition was really not my idea. It was actually, that was, I made the initial phone call, but that idea really gen was generated by Greg Tate. Greg Tate said, what are we gonna do about it? And the name really came from Craig Street, even though he'll deny it. <laughs> but the name, you know, cause we were trying to, what are we gonna call this thing, you know? At one point, it was going to be the Black Rock Collective, and someone said, "That sounds like communism." Yeah, collective always sounds like. <laughs> and, then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then Craig said, "Coalition. We should call it the Black Rock Coalition." And that's how we, you know, it was, it was a child of a, a lot of parents. Con, you know, Conda Mason. You know, she said we should meet again. Like we had that first meeting, and Conda said, "We let's do this again next week." So she was the one that said, "Let's do. Let's have the next meeting." And um, you know, the falafel. it was the second falafel. <laughs> exactly, right? that right? second falafel. <laughs> you know for, for, for Melvin and Will, um, that was a beautiful um, synopsis of a yep. very long story. Um, what, what, what do you think is the relevance of the impact of um, that whole movement in the 80s? I mean, it, 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 well, I, I kind of wanted to fill in a little bit of the backstory, uh, just in terms of this idea of black people shouldn't play rock. I mean, I think at the risk of stating the extremely obvious, I mean, black people invented rock, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, and at and the risk- it was surprising that we didn't grow up knowing that. And, and 
stating something that's maybe not as obvious, uh, but should be obvious from this conversation, a lot of the musicians, to be a good musician is to be a good musician. And people make different choices over the course of their career. Hendrix, fortunately for all of us, made that choice to move forward and do his own thing. But before that, he was playing R&B. He was playing with the Isley Brothers. Before that, he was playing with Little Richard. I mean, there's this breadth of music that African-American mus musicians of a certain generation just all carried with them. Uh, a person that was uh, a, somewhat of a mentor to me later in my life was a man named Pete Cozy. Mm. Who, Pete Cozy is most famous for being the guitar player with Miles Davis during the 70s. He played some really amazing guitar. But before that, Pete Cozy was the guitar player, the session, one of the two main session guitar players along with a man named Phil Upchurch mm -hmm. for Chess Records. Mm -hmm. Pete played on all of those records, mm -hmm. including, a record, including two records, one called Electric Wolf and another one called Electric Mud. <laughs> now, uh, I've been told by good authority <laughs> that the record that Led Zeppelin used to use to hype themselves up before they went to go play was Electric Mud. Mm -hmm. So we've, the influence has always been there. Uh, another thing I would tack on to that to kind of, uh, something Vernon said was kind of interesting. We, would, we were just kids from the neighborhood, but we were, our neighborhood was a very particular neighborhood, as was Will's. And I was told, there's a point where I just stopped talking about the neighborhood because it sounds, starts to sound like I'm name dropping. You know what I mean? Because so many people from the neighborhood did so many incredible things. And we were all just teen, at the time, we were all teenagers and we all just, we all kind of managed to find each other and all the oddballs of the hood just blew up, you know? I mean, so I think, Within that, one, we all just managed to find our own path. But the other thing that's really important, and you, you, have, you have to talk about, I, f I feel like you have to talk about this when you talk about, about the beginnings of hip hop. Um, we don't have enough time to talk about the beginnings of hip hop because whatever. But one important thing is that the beginnings of hip hop is a really interesting example of multiculturalism in action. Because you have the African American community that, create, that brought their music, and you have the Jamaican community that brought their very particular take on how records should be worked, you know, the whole selector and spinning back and pulling out the break beats. That's a, mm. And you got the Latin community that came in with the dance styles and their particular swag that put, you know, just, you know, in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan. I mean, there's a whole, there's this, this hip hop is credited as coming from the Bronx. That's a bit of a simplification, but we'll, we'll leave that for now. We'll, we'll go. We'll, <laughs> We'll we'll go with it. We'll go with the Will and I are looking at <laughs> He's from the Bronx. He knows, you know, I mean. But the thing that's interesting about the Bronx in particular is this crossover between the Puerto Rican community and the African American community. The thing that's particular about Brooklyn is the crossover between the the Caribbean community writ large, whether it's the Puerto Rican community or the Jamaican community or the Haitian community, crossover with the African American community. Now, one to bring that down to a micro level. Brooklyn had a band called Mandrill. That was the official mm. band of Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> Mandrill's whole thing was Mandrill had one of the greatest guitar players ever in their band. Mm -hmm. you know? And Mandrill had a, they were this really funky band that had this really heavy rock edge. Another band that was really important is someone that we both ended up becoming friends with, who was with, uh, the person that was kind of the, the operator of this thing was a man named Edwin Birdsong. Oh, you, you don't know who he is, but you've heard his music because Kanye sampled it for <laughs> a couple of different times, right? Mm -hmm. And he was doing a very particular combination of R&B and rock as well. So this is, this is the thing, it's the thing, I guess the thing I'm, I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to, to make is a point that's almost a, a point of science, which, whereas diversity creates strength. And one of the things about our upbringing is even, you know, is that 
we are kind of the first diversity generation in a certain kind of way. And New York being such a diverse place kind of created these circumstances that allowed this thing to grow. Mm -hmm. go. um, okay, well, that period, it's a, it's a interesting time and I think Vernon and Melvin covered a great deal of it. Um, you know, I, I have my I have my vibes with the Black Rock Coalition uh, title, and 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 the thing about meeting Vernon was great to just talk about it because um, in Berkeley College of Music, where I was a student, um, I had a, a kind of a rock fusion band, and my guitar player was white, and all of my black friends in college didn't like that, and they would always say, "Why do you have this white guitar player? You know, is this supposed to be some kind of a gimmick or something?" And I said, no, he's the only guy in school that has two marshals and distortion pedals and, the, and whammies and all these kind of things. And I was trying to get a sound. I, I, I didn't think about him being white. I'm trying to develop a sound of music. And all of the brothers are playing with the, you know, I used to tease them and say, you know, you guys got this cheesy jazz chorus amps and you're doing that little wah-wah and that cute thing. And I don't want a cute guitar sound. You know, I want a heavy guitar sound. So, um... I remember having the conversations with my own instructors and other classmates about race and, and, and music. Um, I won't drop any names here, but I remember there was a particular jazz royalty family's son who was at my school. And, uh, you already um, dropped a name. <laughs> and, uh, and and, uh, can, everybody can see through that one, man. Well, I was, I, I was trying to quietly drop it. Not to, but th the example is... Um, you know, how rock, I had a conversation with him about how rock is irrelevant, da, da, da. and I remember um, the two doors in the whole dormitory that would stick when you, if you didn't close them properly, the two bedroom doors was mine and this guy's room. And he, if you didn't push the door hard, it wouldn't close all the way. So I'm walking down the hallway, and I hear Stairway to Heaven loud as hell. I'm thinking, this, is, this Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven can't be coming out of this cat's room. So here was the even funniest part. Not only that the music was playing, I recognized his door wasn't closed all the way. Thank God I was with two other jazz snobs at the time who were with me. So I said, man, I'm gonna open the door. They said, well, don't open the door. I said, no, man, maybe somebody's in this room stealing his records, you know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can catch him in the act. I pushed the door open. He's looking out the window playing air guitar, making all of these faces. <laughs> To Led Zeppelin. So I went over, turned the machine off, click, and he turned around and he goes, uh, I only, the introduction is the part that I that find the most interesting. Like, instead of giving it up saying he got busted, he still tried to come off with a thing about, well, it's the introduction. And I'm like, man, you like Led Zeppelin. It's not a crime. You know, it's rock and roll. It's okay, dude. It's okay, man. You know, but I'm saying those things to say, when I met Vernon at BRC, I love the concept and the impetus behind him starting it. But because I was dealing with that in college for four years, I didn't like the title Black Rock Coalition. I'm going to say that honestly. Because I felt like in here, when I met Vernon and we discussed it, I, I got the concept of it. The title bothered me because I felt like it was going to give people an excuse to put us in another category again. Then it was going to become Black Rock. And my vibe is if you're not going to call Van Halen and those guys White Rock, then you shouldn't call us Black Rock. I get it. And I understand the, nece the necessity for having them coalition and the title but I was just coming out of a certain kind of situation where um, you know I was dealing with that on both sides of the equation so that's that's and, and you know I, I like that that it was there but I just had to say and sometimes and when people would talk about it to me and the first person outside of the Black Rock Coalition camp to bring that to my attention when I first met him was Doug Pinnock who plays in an amazing rock band called King's X and Doug, when I first met Doug Pinnock, it's the first thing he walked up to me and asked me about the title of this organization and why is it called that. We talked about it the same way I talked about it with, with, with Vernon. So yeah. I, I want to just... I want to say, say something about that just really quickly because, you know, it, it gets into this thing. Also, it's related to this claim that certain people have made about identity politics mm. when they talk about people of color and things like that. Here's the thing about white supremacy. Basically, what happens is it becomes the standard, so you don't have to say it's white rock. Yep. It's understood. It's, you don't have to say it because that's what the term, you've controlled the terms of the debate. 
Correct. Since the de terms of the debate are set, you have the posi you have the position to kind of say, well, it is what it is, and anything else other than that um, is invalid. Mm -hmm. you say. So in a way, yeah, I can understand why using the word black could be an issue. But because we don't talk about race at all, we don't have the discussion honestly ever at all. When somebody says they, on, on one hand, the last election was crazy because I kept hearing about the white working class from white commentators on, on the news all the time. And then I heard this idea of identity politics, but I, saw, I thought to myself, well, the one identity that's not being questioned is the identity of whiteness. Why isn't that? That's also an identity. If, if you're going to have, a, if you're going to put identity on the table, then all identities are up for discussion. And that's part of the problem. Yes. Part of the problem is that we're not, we can't have the discussion because it's divisive, people feel bad, everyone's uncomfortable. And, the, and because everyone's uncomfortable, let's just have this thing roll on the way it has always rolled on. And because it rolls on the way it's always rolled on, it comes a snowball. The status quo stays in place because we won't have the discussion because everybody gets bummed. You know, and that's because the terms of the debate have been set, you know, from a few hundred years ago. And we're all living under what that is. Yeah. Well, yeah, I want to add on to that because I was actually the one at the first meeting who was who was the the naysayer on the name, and Greg Tate brought up a very interesting point because he went on to talk about the manifesto, and he said something that at that time I just was not with at all, the, and I can't. I was trying to remember the exact phraseology. But it was, set, it was something to the effect of, we reserve the right to be normal. And that offended me at the time. I was like, dude, I'm like best player in New York. I mean, in my mind, in whatever. I'm kind of like, I'm doing, I'm doing my best to be excellent. I don't want to be normal. Who wants to be normal? It took me literally having a child to get the point that he was trying to make. When you raise a kid, you don't, you don't want your kid to have to be the exemplar that stood every, over everybody else and got out the ghetto and the rest of the people are stuck in the ghetto. You want your kid to just be a kid like any other kid. Exactly. And that's the point that we're making. That's the point that Greg was trying to get across to me that took me a, you know, took me a minute to actually grok what he was getting at. Now, to, to go back to the name, the day we are normal is the day we won't need to use that. We won't need to put that terminology in front. Exactly. We are not at that point yet. It's just the facts. You know, it's like it's like when somebody, when you hear one of the older heads say, when you accomp very accomplished people, they say, you know, you have to work twice as hard to get half as much. And I and I say, well, just hearing that, that sounds to me, that sounds insane. That sounds like an insane way to have to live. It's an incredibly, the idea that you have to be super impressive all the time and have to be the top of your class just to live, that's incredibly oppressive. That's, that's, you know what I mean? The fact that you have to be the credit, whatever ethnicity you're a part of, the fact that you have to be a credit to that is nuts. And one of my favorite things when I, when I talk about this examining whiteness, whiteness is a fiction. Everybody is part of whatever ethnic background they're a part of. One of the things that's so problematic about this thing is, well, who's white enough? That's what the whole thing of the Aryan nonsense, you know, that's, you know, Hitler, who was, had dark hair and was a shrimp, was talking about the Norwegians. <laughs> It's been, you know, it's bananas, right? This kind of, kind of crazy, impossible standard, right? So the idea that there's some kind of unity in this construct is something that's oppressive to, for everyone. And that's the point. 
And on that point, and we would love to, this, to continue on, but actually there's a next phase of this, um, and then we have to go to have dinner. Uh, we have an appointment. So on that note, um, let's thank our three marvelous guests and speakers. Ha! And um, I would like my colleague, um, Richard, to come and close things up. I think it's closed. I'm a rich is like whatever. <laughs>